right, guys, welcome back to the Pursuit of Property podcast. Today, we are joined by our good friend and mortgage lender, David Keller. David is the owner of the Keller team at Nexa Mortgage. Mm -hmm. He's been in the business for quite some time now with great experience, and he's helped tons of our borrowers personally, and he's also helping me personally, currently. And we wanted to have him on to talk a little bit about uh, the ABCs of buying a house. Yeah, absolutely. I think in my sixth year, I was just thinking about that today, actually. So just really? starting the beginning of my sixth year of lending. So six years, what were you doing before lending? Uh, I did a few different things. Immediately before, I had done about six months of solar sales, which has obviously, I'm sure you guys can imagine, come in oddly helpful in yeah. this, in this uh, industry, understanding the contracts, being able to read through trip bills with clients. So that kind of worked out well. And then two and a half years prior to that, I was doing... Uh, Working, working in the car business. So I did finance for about a, a little over a year mm -hmm. and then a long stint in the restaurant industry, which I think you guys both can appreciate. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Dude, so you've had a little bit of, of everything. You started with customer service and, and the service industry, then you rotated into finance, then sales, and now you're kind of a mix of all of that. <laughs> yeah, essentially, it, 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 a very roundabout way. I didn't know I was collecting skill sets that would yeah. you know work so well in this current career, but yeah, it's all worked out kind of well. Yeah. And David, we were telling you before the show, we've done one, if you guys remember, all the way back in season one, our second episode ever, we talked a little bit about the home buying process and pre-approval and stuff like that. Yeah. But the main reason Scott and I wanted to have you on is one... You're a really good friend. You're a killer. You're a beast in the industry. Like Scott said, you're helping, I, I mean, quite a few of our borrowers right now. You're helping Scott personally. Mm -hmm. And we've been getting a lot of questions lately and interest in buying a house, right? Ha people we know wanting to buy a house, but them having kind of unrealistic or construed expectations on that process. So yeah. in that process, where do you think to start us off? Where does a person start? That's a great question. I think, and I, even just to touch on a little bit of the misinformation before I hop into that, if that's okay. Yeah. I remember getting into lending for homes. And when I started at my new job, it, it there was support there, but it was also kind of the sink or swim, go out and find the information for yourself. Mm -hmm. And so I had even bought a home prior to becoming a lender, didn't understand the process. And then when I got into lending and I was trying to do my own research, and even with the information that I had and the context that I had, going online and watching YouTube videos and Googling stuff and just searching, reading articles, I almost became more confused than you know things becoming simplified because depending on what site you're looking at, it could be a different county, state, year, program than actually applies to you, especially interest rates wise and different kinds of programs that might be out there. So it can really be a really confusing place when you're, you know, buying especially your first home even if you're buying a home again and you haven't been in the market in right. 5 10 15 years things change all the time so in terms of in terms of what I would recommend for someone who's trying to purchase a home whether it's their first home or you know second third you know a replacement home investment property whatever the case might be i think a consultation with a a local knowledgeable lender is the best place you can start because it's going to really set your expectations in terms of what possible obstacles might be in your way they're gonna help make sure that they can help you be realistic in terms of timelines and goals of what you wanna accomplish. And then it's gonna set the framework of your options really nicely so that you're not gonna get your hopes up or get you know misinformation and then have your heart broken down the line. Yeah. I was gonna ask, so when when going to purchase a home, obviously it's, it's a long process. You and I have been, I'll be, I'll use myself as an example. You and I have been in active communication about buying a home for what? 18 months yeah well uh, yeah well over a year <laughs> so and i'm somebody who's very familiar with the home buying process and when you and i first sat down i was super eager i was like oh this is going to be a piece of cake we're going to sit down david's going to approve me and i'm going to be in a house by next month mm -hmm. and i remember the conversation that we had which was like hey man after looking at your stuff here's some of the issues that we're going to need to resolve and it's going to take some time mm -hmm. and it doesn't mean that you can't buy a house yeah but it requires that we practice some preparation stuff um i find myself sometimes responding to people's financial situations and saying hey just as a heads up here are some of the basic requirements and they'll say well i don't meet this that or the other and i'll end up saying look 
if you don't meet that, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Probably best move is to still talk to a lender. Do you feel like that's the same thing? Yeah, I totally do. And I, I think that some of the hesitancy for a lot of clients is probably past experiences, right? That haven't worked out so, so well. Mm -hmm. And it's, if you really think about it, it's kind of like a financial undressing to meet with a, you know, oh, a lender. Yeah. It's like going to the doctor's office and then having you disrobe because they're going to probably look at your credit score. They're going to look at your bank statements, pay stubs, W-2s, how your money's being spent, what your savings are, if there's collections or mispayments, all that stuff's going to come to light. So I think there's this, you know, kind of inherent nervousness of being so vulnerable, yeah. which I totally get. And I don't take that lightly that someone or, you know, even my friends are willing to show me all of their personal information it's right. really a big step and so i think not only is there some hesitancy with just the vulnerability of what you're going to share but if they've had past experiences or heard stories of friends and family that's also where i think a lot of that fear comes from absolutely where they're like well yeah my cousin you know met with a lender and they just basically told them to kick rocks and come back in six months when their credit was fixed and it's like isn't the point of meeting with a lender to get those steps and to kind of be walked along the process. I, I think a lot of lenders, and I, I don't want to say anybody by name, I just think it's it's easy in this industry when you get busy and you have a lot of inquiries to only want to help people who are ready now. right then and yeah. now and tell them, hey, come back in six months. I don't have time for you. Whereas I, I found a lot of success in my own personal business in just taking an extra 30 minutes to an hour and walking them through what it's going to take to get them there, whether it's with you, you know, might be over a year. I've had clients that I've met with and it takes almost two years for them to buy a house. Some of right. them never do. Some of them might take two to three months. I mean, it just really depends on each circumstance. So I think a lot of that hesitancy is because of past experiences for themselves or people that they know in their, you know, sphere, mm -hmm. you know, of family and friends. And also just the inherent fact that it's pretty uncomfortable to share all of that information. Yeah. And you mentioned you, you called it a consultation earlier, but I want to talk about you specifically just from uh, my experience with you. I'm sure Scott's too, and our clients feedback that we've gotten from you and what you were talking about a little bit earlier before we started mm -hmm. was it's, it's not really a consultation is kind of a big, you know, scary word, especially yeah. for buyers who, you know, are a little anxious to have their financial undressing in front of a lender. Yeah. Right. Um, I think you do a really good job of really just making it a conversation, right? And it, not not a consultation. I'm not sure what the right word for it, but, but an introduction, you know, a, yeah. just a quick chat over the phone um, and, and doing that sort of stuff. But also a great point for people who are not ready now, but you help them take the steps to say, okay, this needs to be here we're here now how are we going to get there right exactly so we've got the buyers there now right they, they've had their consultation they've had their introduction with you right now after that where do they go so i think it depends every, every client's a little different i think that's what i also enjoy so much is that it's no, no two deals i mean you guys know this on the real estate side there really are no two deals that are the same there are so many different factors and things that come into play. So that's where it's kind of fun. And I, I enjoy the creativity of it, um, being a little artistic myself, mm -hmm. right? I think it's fun because everyone's timelines and unique, you know, uh, goals and possible hurdles are going to be very unique. So for some clients, it might be, okay, you're ready now, you're approved. Now you're going to obviously need to have that connection with a realtor, right? So sometimes they come to that consultation, they've already met a realtor. If not, then, you know, I, I might be able to make some suggestions, right? You know, in terms of people that they could go work with. Mm -hmm. And then what I always try, and I had this conversation yesterday, I did a couple consultations yesterday. What I always tell my clients, especially first time buyers, and I think that's a lot of the people you're trying to have this message for, right? Yeah. Is that... When once you've gone through the process, even if all of your ducks in a row, right, you have your credits where it needs to be to qualify, you have the savings or gift funds, you know, you have the income and the job history to qualify. It, it's really not going to make much sense and it's not going to really gel until you've actually gotten to go out with a realtor and look at homes at different price points in different neighborhoods and you match up, okay, this payment is for this house. And I think that this house is worth that payment because right. when all you're doing is looking at a certain payment or a, a program, whether it's FHA, conventional, right. VA, you know, all these different programs and price points, 
it's it's so removed from reality when it's just numbers on a page but when you take those numbers and the down payment all of the fees and cost to close and then you get to go walk through a house and feel it it becomes so much more real and apparent as to what's actually worth your money yeah. you know because it's we're not going to be paying those bills for them we're not paying their mortgage or bringing the cash to close so they really need to go and associate different homes and neighborhoods with those numbers on the page. So for someone who's ready right then and there, I'd say that's the next step. That's so awesome that you say that because the reason why I I feel that meeting with a lender is so important before you shop is that there's an emotional attachment that comes when you look at homes. Yes. Regardless if you are in a rush to move, you're just looking, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whatever the situation is, I think we can all relate to the feeling that when you walk into a home that you really like, you get a feeling of like, I need this house and I, like yes. I need to make this offer mm -hmm. and the process of getting ready usually can take longer than it takes for a seller, especially in this market to get an offer yes. that they like and take. Mm -hmm. And so I've seen people fall in love with a house who haven't been pre-approved because I show them one house for free. Right. And then here I am. I look like the jack wagon who showed you the house that you can't afford yeah. because Maybe we didn't know your financial situation and maybe there's debts that we didn't know about that affect your loan. Yeah. Or for myself specifically, when I've called you in the past, it's like, hey, David, I found a house I like. And you're like, well, let's talk. Have you fixed these things? Have you gotten your taxes filed? And it's like, well, shoot, I haven't. And it's like, well, that was needed for you to get that price point. Yeah. And well, I remember that. that yeah. And that feeling. house might not exist in a week from now. And especially in this yeah. market in a day or two, you know, <laughs> right. they might be reviewing offers later today. So I, yeah, I totally agree with and you. So it's always important. It's just like in a relationship, you have to understand what you're getting into before you dive head first and mm -hmm. get all your feelings. Like with a house, it's, I mean, it's a huge commitment. And like, if you find a house that you love, you're going to think that's the only house that will work for me. And now yeah. your whole home buying process is going to feel like jaded because you didn't do it in the right order. Yeah, and I like that you touched on the emotional part of it too, because uh, I think that that gets discounted when people are looking at homes. I mean, when you're when you're daydreaming, you're talking, and you're you know scrolling on whatever you know app of your choice that will remain unnamed, but whatever app you might be <laughs> scrolling on, no free press. Uh, if you're scrolling on that app and you're looking at different home points, I mean, I think everyone's been guilty of doing that for fun or laying in bed at night or you right. know, sending homes back and forth with your significant other or friends. Uh, it's really easy to not understand how emotional it is when it's actually for you and then you are visualizing oh thanksgiving could be there super bowl fourth of july my birthday we could have friends over parties christmas like the emotional aspect of buying a home i think oftentimes gets kind of swept under, under the rug and you don't get it until you're in the process of actually looking and it's it's really i think important to get the less emotional parts handled up front like you're saying in a relationship know what you're getting into know what you qualify for and then know what you can afford and then <laughs> and then when you go out to actually look at a property it's going to help at least set some parameters to, right. to help you not get your feelings hurt the other part i like to say about that is that most people i know most can afford or, or can get pre-approved for a house mm -hmm. much more than their lifestyle will afford them Yes. Not to say that they couldn't make the sacrifice and do mm -hmm. it, but to say that for them to buy it at their max, they would be s cutting out large portions no of their current, dash. No right, their current lifestyle. So I always talk to people, even after they've had your consultation or a lender's consultation, and they say, ah, I'm pre-approved to 450000 I say, great, that's awesome. Let's sit down, let's talk. The first question I've learned to ask now is, what payment a month would you be comfortable with? Mm-hmm. And I know from personal experience now that that number is going to be well under their pre-approval. And then I say, this is great. Let's start by looking at the lower end homes. Yes. Because as you go up in price, your emotions will rise and then you'll never be able to love a house in the lower price again. Mm -hmm. And you say, great, let's look at the cheaper houses. And if we can find you something you love at a price that you can really be comfortable at, that's the best solution. And if we have to go up a little to find a home that you feel like is perfect, then we can, but we did it in the right order. Again, you're not starting at the like million dollar homes and coming down to your price point. You start at the comfortability mm -hmm. and then you work your way up to the million dollar homes. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And in terms of a similar field that I was in before, right, working in uh, car sales, 
you don't take someone onto the brand new, like let's say you're working at a Ford dealership, the brand new like $90,000 marked up, tricked out truck when mm-hmm. they're buying their first truck. That's not how you start. Now, there might be someone who that is the right first truck and they prepare themselves for it and they're ready. But you'll but, make your way there. Yeah, nine times out of 10, you really should be starting them, you know, asking those questions and showing them the different things because if you start on the every bell and whistle perfectly tricked out, checking every wish list box, that you go back to see the other thing and be like, oh, well, the carpet and that I don't like. It's like, it's your first house. Like, it, you can change those things, but it's hard to not see them once you've gone and looked at the perfect creme de la creme, right. checking every box. Yeah, I completely and, agree. And the house was going to be perfect for you had yes. you done it in the right order. Mm-hmm. You would have none of that resentment. You exactly. would have none of that. It's not winner's purse. It's like uh, like keeping up with the Joneses. Yeah. Like you, you walk in a house. Anybody who's never owned a house could walk in a somewhat dilapidated home and see that this home could be beautiful. Yeah. And they only start losing that vision, I think, or some people do, not everybody, when they start looking at the fully done homes and then they look at the house that could use a little love Mm -hmm. and they're like, oh, this thing's all worn down. And it's like, that's not how houses work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, and it's, it's, I'm glad you touched on that as well. And it's just, it's, you've, if you've never purchased a home, you just have no concept of purchasing a home. I mean, there is nothing else in your life that you've purchased that's like that. A car is not like it. Nearly every, nearly everything else that you've purchased over a thousand dollars is going to depreciate nearly. I mean, almost everything you buy will. There's very, there's a few, you know, exceptions to that rule. But homes are actually considered an asset, and it's something you can, you know, rehab and you can renovate and you can update and increase the value while living there. Mm-hmm. So it's just, it's a very different mentality when you're shopping for a house than almost really anything else. And I want to take a pause. I know we're going to dive into some numbers that'll be helpful for people listening and watching, but. For that first time home buyer or for somebody like you said, somebody who hasn't bought a home in five, 10 years and things have changed. We've been throwing out a lot of terms like cash to close, conventional, FHA, Mm -hmm. some of those key ones. Do you mind just explaining what that means for Mm -hmm. people who who don't know? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the the way that I try to explain different uh, loan types is just different tools, right? So they're different tools to get the job done. Uh, VA loans, I think people, some people have heard about them. It's obviously for, you know, veterans, right? That's what it's for. Whether you've act, served active or reserve, there's different, you know, guidelines in terms of how you're going to qualify, but it's an excellent product. The majority of people though that are purchasing the first house are going to be looking at FHA or conventional, right? So I recommend people to consider them as a shovel and a broom. They are just good at different things, right? So I think people always are asking me, and I'm sure you've heard it as well. They're like, what loan type's best? My grandpa or my uncle or my cousin or my boss said this loan type's the best, mm-hmm. or I have to go conventional. Well, why? Like, why do you have to go that route versus this one? So really, it's FHA is going to be backed by the federal government. It's going to be much more lenient for first-time homebuyers especially because – it affords them better interest rates, you know, in terms of when you're comparing the side by side, especially for like maybe someone in the 600 credit score range, it's going to be a lot easier to qualify for your home with an FHA loan. They're a lot more uh, open to, you know, hiccups on credit. You know, if you hit some speed bumps, if you had some medical collections, some late payments, uh, if your debt to income ratio, you know, in terms of the gross income that you make every month before taxes, versus all of your fixed monthly bills that are going to apply. So your mortgage, car payments, student loans, credit cards, they're going to basically look at your your gross income and then compare that to all of your fixed bills, excluding a few like health insurance, cell phone bills, things like that. And, and they're going to try to help determine what kind of a home you can purchase. FHA is much more lenient in that sense. When it gets into maybe higher down payment and a higher purchase price, conventional loans are going to open up and be a better option. FHA is, you know, in Fresno County, I think the, the purchase price is right around 436 or so for three and a half percent down. They don't have a cap on the purchase price because you could buy a million dollar house. FHA just cares about your loan amount. So they want your loan amount to be right around 420 or so. And so with conventional loans, you can go up into the, you know, having loan types in the, in the middle 600. So I think a lot of times people get hung up on particular loan options. But it's really, that's a part of that consultation. Just looking at your exact circumstances. What are your goals? What's your timeline, your price point? And then you just kind of compare them side by side. I think it's always good to look at both options and just see the, the pros and cons of both. 
But in a sh you know nut shelling, I would just say FHA is a lot easier for first time home buyers. It's a lot easier if you're trying to go owner occupied on a multifamily. I mean, it's that's where a lot of people talk about the house hacking concept of buying a multifamily, you know, a duplex, triplex, or fourplex, and living in one of the units. You can only use three and a half percent down for that option. I, I have a client I was talking to just last week about that. He he wasn't aware. He was considering buying maybe a duplex. But on a conventional loan, once you switch to you know more than one unit, you're looking at 15% down. That's a huge barrier to entry for a first-time buyer, versus you know being able to purchase something with just three and a half percent down, live in one of the units, and allow the other tenants to help you know offset your mortgage and and maybe you know possibly even cash flow. Who knows? So yeah, it really is just uh, they're both great programs. They they service a lot of different circumstances, and that's something that I definitely touch on in all of my consultations a lot more in depth. Gotcha. And so we've got our ma main two options, right? You mentioned VA uh, as another option. Um, and I want to backtrack a little bit to when we were talking about people, obviously one, like Scott mentioned, will be surprised at how much they can get pre-approved for, pre for mm -hmm. excuse me, but really, you know, their comfortable monthly payment being here. But even farther back than that, mm -hmm. for somebody who goes uh that let's use a first time home buyer for example who's like you know i don't think my credit's that great you know I, i'm stuck with a kind of high car payment you know I, i'd really love to buy a house but you know, you know there there's no way i will i'm not i'm not even going to waste my time talking to anybody or this that and the other i've always been a proponent and i've had people reach out to me who say that and i say hey look you you won't know if you don't talk or you don't try or you don't find out like if yeah. you're just going to sit here for the next five years because if you're in that mindset of oh you know i've got xyz you know it's not going to work you won't know unless you talk to somebody that's that's what i've been a proponent of would you say the same thing yeah i think i mean i think it's just like anything i mean there's people who don't want to go to the doctor they don't want to file their taxes they don't want to i mean there's buy a car there's so many things that are kind of they seem so uncomfortable and a lot of them are i mean I don't like going to car lots. I used to work at car lots. I shudder going to a car lot. I used to hate the dentist, don't anymore. But I think the concept of that financial stress and who who really wants to go into a circumstance where they're pretty sure the person's gonna tell them, no, you don't qualify for this. Like, I think that's such a, that's we, we already deal with so much reject, rejection and stress and anxiety in our, in our world. I think it's very easy to think that, that that's gonna be just like any of those other experiences where you're going to want to do something and then your hopes are going to be, you know, completely crushed. So I think it's it's definitely worth meeting with somebody. I I haven't ever really had a consultation with someone uh, and I mean I've talked to people on the whole spectrum of credit score, income, savings, ability, you know, to purchase or not and I've never had someone be like, "Wow, this was a waste of my time." You know. Because what's the worst case scenario, right? Is You've got somebody like you who isn't just going to, you know, wipe their hands clean and leave somebody in the dust. You've now got somebody who's going to help you with a game plan to get to that point when you are able to do that, right? Yeah. And in my mind, that's a heck of a lot better having that set game plan with a professional on your side yeah. than not knowing and keep going through and not having a game plan and you're in the same place. Yeah. You and know, it, I, I think it's later. kind of, it's kind of, I mean, depressing to be honest, it's a depressing place to be where you're just like, eh, well, the, you know, ho-hum, ho-hum, this is how it is. I, yeah. you know, I'm just going to rent for forever or I, I can't ever afford, or I couldn't ever do that. Whereas, I mean, the kind of clientele that I've gotten to help, a lot of them are, are under, underserved. And, you know, a lot of my clients I meet with, like you were talking about, maybe not having excellent credit, that's also where meeting with a really good lender who goes maybe a couple steps above and beyond. I've helped a lot of my clients look into doing credit repair, you know, in terms of, you know, fixing, you know, negative things on their credit or, you know, bringing down balances. There's lots of tools that I have at my disposal that are able to help me accurately forecast where your credit score is going to go. Where I, I had a client referred to me by our buddy Diego, right, who we all know. And uh, we're looking at somewhere between nine months to three months to get his credit fixed, depending on what opportunities he had with his friends and family, you know, in terms of what opportunities um, he might be able to finagle. And so mm -hmm. I thought, you know, worst case scenario, maybe about nine, 10 months for him to get qualified. But over the course of our conversation, I was asking if he might have some friends or family that 
had the ability to maybe add him as an authorized user onto some credit cards paying down maybe like a, a repossessed auto there's all these different circumstances that i didn't know he would be open to and so that that window shortened from 10 months to like two so right. i got to tell diego yesterday like hey i i think this guy can actually maybe even get approved before summer and even i didn't know that because you don't know until you know right until yeah. you have that open and honest conversation and you look at everything you don't know what your options are and when you might be able to qualify and i really think that the majority of people out there that are on the fence and wondering it is not as difficult to qualify as you think that it is. It's just not. Unless you're self-employed. <laughs> I thought you were going to say unless you're Scott. <laughs> so let's talk about it. So um, I was caught off guard when I first started um, by the amount of money it takes to get into a home. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it seemed like it was way more than I would have expected. And other times it seemed like, how the heck did you get into this house for so little? Mm -hmm. That's where the value of the different loan products comes in. Um, can we break down before we get into the numbers, uh, of, of what maybe some current day estimates or like projections could potentially be, let's talk a little bit about the different assortment of costs. So my understanding when you're looking, um, you want to have both an idea of what, how much money you want to bring mm -hmm. into the close of escrow. How much cash have I saved that I'm willing to let go mm -hmm. to get into a home? And then also how much money am I willing to spend per month on the house? Yes. That's like typically the two numbers I talk about when I talk yeah. with somebody, what kind of, what, what do you talk about? And like, what fees should you be aware of before you go and go home shopping? Uh, so beyond just the down payment, I mean, I think it's, there's, first of all, there's a lot of misinformation. I think some people still really do think that you need 20% down payment to buy a house. I hear it all the time. I, I still hear that. So it's just really not true. The, the conventional loans, obviously there's benefits to doing 20% down and, you know, not to get into the nitty gritty of like mortgage insurance, but that's a buzzword that a lot of people think about and they think it's such an evil thing and they're mad at it and they need to avoid it at all costs. It's just another part of the process and it's it's a tool that allows people to buy houses with not having to save 20% down. So right. you can look at it as your enemy or you can look at it as kind of a, you know, an ally in the home buying process that doesn't, you know, helps you, helps you get in with less than a 20% down payment. So I think when you're trying to purchase a home, especially if you're a first-time home buyer, if you have excellent credit, you know, uh, there are options on a conventional loan to get in with 5% or even 3% down on a primary residence. And then for FHA, the standard down payment is, you know, three and a half. So that's very easy to calculate, you know, a sales price, take, you know, my pull out my cell phone and punch in three and a half percent or 3%. It's very simple math to figure out what the down payment is. It's on the kind of the backside of the loan where you're talking about some of this one-time fees and it's some the hidden cost. Yeah, exactly. That's what a lot, I hear a lot of people ask me, they're like, well, what's the hidden cost? Exactly. And I think it's poorly explained by a lot of lenders and they kind of brush over it. They just kind of say, hey, it's this lump sum of money and they don't tell people, they don't itemize it. And it's also, I think in that sense, it's kind of the lender being a little nervous about like, well, I don't want to shine the bright light on this extra number right here because it's scary. I'm just going to brush over it and you know, move on to the next thing quickly so that I don't scare the client yeah, away. It's just but a fact. I pause, and I think you guys have seen this. I, I stop with every client, and I itemize out the prepaid ta you know, property taxes and homeowner's insurance because the majority of people are going to have a payment that's going to include four different aspects, right? So whether you're putting down a large down payment or not, on FHA, you don't have a choice. Your payment's going to include four things, right? You're not going to include your PG&E or your water and trash or your internet, but it's going to be the principal and interest payment to the lender for the money that you're borrowing. So that's what most people call your mortgage. Exactly. But the, the other three things that are included is going to be your property taxes, right? Which in Fresno County, we usually structure it at one and a quarter percent of the sales price, right? So varies from location around the country. Exactly. It's going to vary in Fresno County locally, roughly, you know, one and a quarter percent is a good estimate. Uh, per year. And then you're going to have your homeowner's insurance, which protects, you know, liability in case someone were to get hurt on your property or, you know, pipes burst, a tree falls on your house, car drives through the front yard, you know, could be any host of things that's protecting that investment for you and the lender. And then you're also, if you don't put down 20%, you're going to have that mortgage insurance payment as well. So it's going to include all of those things. That's, you know, that's one side of the itemization of the payments, but on the back side. You have to set up accounts that are going to handle your taxes and your insurance for you, right? So that's something that a lot of people don't know. It's called an impound account, right? And that's a one-time cost of purchasing the home 
that you have to bring to the closing table, right? So beyond the down payment, you're probably gonna bring all things considered around two and a half percent beyond that to cover setting up your taxes and insurance account, right? And then also covering things like the one-time appraisal on the home. That's, you know, ensuring the home is habitable, no major health or safety issues, and that the value is matching what you're purchasing the home for, right? Which is, it's protecting you and mainly protecting the lender, right? And their investment. You have other things, you know, processing charges, the title company who transfers ownership, the notary, there's, you know, recording fees with the county. There's so many different things that when you go through a consultation, I want to cover so people know where their money's going. Because I think it's too big of an ask to tell someone, especially let's say a 300 or let's say a $400,000 house, two and a half percent is a significant amount of money. It's nearly $10,000. So I wouldn't expect anyone to trust me when I say, Hey, by the way, you know, this is your down payment on 400,000. Let's say it's, you know, 12 grand on a 3% down. And then this other 10 grand, just say, yeah, trust me, these are other fees associated. Like that seems very shady. And unfortunately I think that's what a lot of clients get. They get that like, Oh, well it's us other fees and they don't know what they go to. And it doesn't inspire confidence. It makes you kind of want to hold your bank account Mm-hmm. tighter can you clarify uh some of the impounded fees mm-hmm. that actually is money you would have spent anyways you're just asked to bring it forward yeah it's, so that way you're like it's like almost like a safety net well and it's literally called prepaids right so it's it's not a there's two different parts of your uh in terms of other fees besides the down payment on the home there's two other categories so one is just prepaids which is literally prepaying costs that are going to happen no matter what for your property taxes and your homeowner's insurance. And the reason that's set up is to help people not fall behind, right? So they understand that the cost of purchasing a home is significant. And then if you're going to be hit later in the year, you know, twice a year, you're going to have property taxes that are due, which can be in the thousand, it's usually in the thousands of dollars, you know, one to 2000 at at least for each of those two installments. And then your, your homeowner's insurance premium every year might run a thousand dollars as well. Those are significant bills. And if you don't think ahead and plan for those and have it all packaged into the mortgage, it's very easy for people to fall behind and get into a position where then this investment is no longer really an investment. It becomes a burden and it Mm -hmm. becomes a a stressor in their life. When you set up your your prepaid account, that kind of handles that. The other aspect is going to be the closing costs. And those are the one-time fees, right? Like the appraisal, your credit report, the title and notary fees transfer taxes, you know, all of those kinds of things, the processor, those kinds of fees are just each time you have a transaction, whether you're purchasing or refinancing, you're going to have those closing right. costs. Prepaids are, you know, situational, but n- most of the time people are selecting to have that prepaid impound account for their property taxes and homeowners insurance. And I think it's really a nice tool. It's definitely, yeah. you have to be aware of it, you know, when you're trying to purchase a home, cause it's yeah. extra cash to close, usually three, four, five grand, depending on the sales price. But it's not, it's not something that's trying to inhibit you, and it's not some hidden fee or cost. Like you said, you're going to pay it anyways. It's just helping make sure that you're staying on top of it and you're not falling behind. Perfect. So when, when people are looking to come sit down with a lender, maybe a good practice if before they go talk to the lender, if they are very insecure, uncomfortable with going and talking to you, because mm-hmm. nobody wants, like you said, if they're feeling uncomfortable about their financials, sharing that with a stranger of all people, yeah, maybe something that they could consider is uh, when they're calculating what they think they might want to purchase home for, mm-hmm. they could maybe estimate, okay, well, if I have 20,000 in savings, David suggesting that if I were to go, uh, you know, you know, a 5% or a 3.5, you know, I could estimate what my down payment might be. You will never be able to really get a good estimate of what your payment is because that changes so frequently with the interest rates. Yes. But they could at least say, well, how much would be my goal targeted savings before I go talk to a lender? So that way I know, okay, at least have the money to like try to close. Yeah. And I I would say the simple answer, I mean, and it's, it's kind of, it's not going to be exact, but exactly what you're talking about for a first time home buyer, especially who's just trying to make sure that they're not way off. Right. I would suggest to have somewhere around 6%. You know, and whether it's all in your savings or you have a 401k that you can borrow from or you have an aunt, uncle, cousin, brother, significant other that can gift you funds for the purchase, as long as you can kind of figure out a way tax return season is coming up. So that's something where a lot of people use those funds too. 
there's so many different ways to solve that problem of the cash to close for a lot of people that as long as you can kind of figure out how to have around maybe 6%, obviously the payment might change. You know, it probably will depend on your circumstances and the purchase price, but it's very easy to look at a $300,000 house, plug in 6%. Okay, 18,000 is a pretty safe number for me to have if I'm trying to buy my first house. Can you explain real quick, because a lot of people our age get some kind of gift funds. It's mm-hmm. just, it's very common. Oh yeah. Um, and I think nobody talks about it because nobody likes to say, oh, my parents helped mm-hmm. me or you know, my significant other helped me or whatever. Mm-hmm. But can you explain how that would work? If somebody was sitting there and they're so close and maybe they have the job that makes the income, but they haven't had the time to save it and they want to get into the market now, yeah. what, what does that look like and how would that look for you? Yeah. I mean, and that's something I also, I try to say with clients. I mean, I understand. And I totally, totally respect people that are wanting to do it all on their own, right? I mean, I respect that drive, but I also want to encourage people like, don't let your pride stand in the way of you being able to enjoy the it, the benefits of home ownership. Like that's very silly, you know. The, at the financial end of the day. game, yeah. yeah, it's yeah. it's silly, and there's so many people that you know help you, whether or not you want to acknowledge it. Your family has helped you become the person you are, no matter what. Whether you see the financial money, the dollars in your pocket or your bank account. There's so many people that have affected you and benefited you and assisted you along the way. And I don't think there's any shame in having a little bit of assistance when you're buying a home, especially your first house. And so it really is not difficult. If you have a family member, you know, and it could be uncles, aunts, cousins, grandparents. I mean, it could be so many different kinds of sources. They, throughout the process of the transaction, depending on what kind of loan type you are, if it's conventional, there's a little less paperwork needed. FHA, we're going to have to see a bank statement from the donor, right? So you're going to have to at least be able to source the funds. They want to make sure that it's not money coming from ill-gotten gains, right? Or, you know, mm-hmm. you know, they want to make sure that they can source where the funds are coming from on an FHA loan. For a conventional loan, they're just going to require a gift letter to be filled out by both parties, basically showing, hey, this is the account number of where it's going to come from. This is the dollar amount. And then that money can be sent near the very end of the transaction. I think the other thought with gift funds is, well, they haven't given me the money yet. You know, it's not in my account. They're going to give it to me soon. Or, you know, uh, I don't, you know, what if I try to get into escrow? I put in an offer and I don't have all of those, that money in my account. I can't buy a house. Completely false. You know, the gift funds usually come like the, the second to third week of the transaction once you've gotten an offer accepted. So as long as we know where it's com- coming from and you've had that conversation and it's dialed in, then there's no problem. You don't have to have it in your account up front. You don't need to have it in there for multiple months. It's a very simple, you know, gift letter that gets sent out to both parties and they don't the the person who's helping you doesn't need to see all of the information on your loan. They're not going right. to see your credit score. They're not going to be at the table for you signing docs. They don't even necessarily they're not going to know what the purchase price is or the interest rate or the payment. They they're only privy to the information that you're wanting to share with them. All they're doing is financially, you know, transferring the money over and signing that gift letter. Cool. Sweet. Are we ready for some numbers? Yeah. So we're going to talk about some numbers now. And it's really, really pertinent that we disclose that these numbers are not guaranteed in any way, shape, or form for any borrower. We're trying on this podcast to give people a ballpark number Mm -hmm. for the month of February in 2022, where current market rates are sitting at. Mm -hmm. And if you're interested... It's important that you talk to a lender personally and you like go David. through this process, you. right? You have to go through this process in order to get these numbers. But because we've had people reach out with unrealistic expectations of what their closing costs or monthly payments might be, we wanted to share this as a ballpark figure. Yeah. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I'd say that's totally fair. I would say it's obviously none of these are commitment to lend, right? You got to go through the pre-approval process. You have to get uh, you know, your mortgage credit pulled and everything else reviewed. But I think that these will probably help give a rough idea as to what you could expect, you know, right. when you're looking for a home. The days of old, you could get a house for forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 yeah. is no longer here. No. And there were years where we had interest rates in like the 18% range. Mm-hmm. And we're also not there. No. So just know that markets change. It's when you actually go to purchase a home, you sign off on all these disclosures that explain this too. Mm-hmm because this has been a problem. So we wanted to bring David on as well to share some of these figures. Yeah. Now, no, David's going to also, correct me if I'm wrong, but my experience is David's also going to, after he sits down with you, provide these numbers to you for your specific life. 
this is the information that you need to know before you go sit down with the agent yes. and go look at houses. Because then if you say to yourself, well, I have 40000 but my loan's going to be 38000 and I'm not okay living with 2000 in savings, that is a totally acceptable statement. Mm-hmm. And now you already have that pre-approval. It lasts for a few months, three months, I believe. Yeah. It, yeah. it varies. Yeah. Usually at least three months, yeah. And uh, now you have a game plan. Mm-hmm. So... Take it away, David. Perfect. Yeah. So I know you guys asked me to provide, you know, kind of mock up a couple different price points here. So I have a 350 FHA, you know, with good credit, three and a half percent down. And then I'm going to compare that to two different options on a conventional loan at about 400,000 on the purchase price. So, I mean, all things considered on the FHA loan in terms of the monthly payment for all four aspects, right? For the the principal and interest, the uh, property taxes, homeowners insurance and the mortgage insurance, you're looking at roughly around 2173. That would be your monthly payment on an FHA loan in that price point of 350. It was 2173. Yeah, right around 2173. So if you're on any of the consumer company uh, or the consumer websites right now, Mm -hmm. and you're looking on Zillow, or you're looking on Redfin or wherever you're at, I can't believe you said their names. Well, you know what? (laughs) I feel so confident that we can do better than them. I'm not too nervous about it. Me too. But if you're on a website and you're looking at houses in the 350s and you say to yourself, I freaking love this thing, Mm -hmm. approximately your payment's going to be around that 2,000, a little more, a little less, depending on your situation. Exactly. If you were to buy right now. Yeah, I think with with an FHA loan and that, you know, three and a half percent down, that's a very good estimate as to where you'd be at. And real quick, good point on the shopping thing, which is where I think it comes down to not only having a trusted lender, but also a trusted realtor on your side is depending on the market you're in. I mean, right now we're in February of 22. um, Depending on what kind of market it is, if you're looking at a home that is on the Zillow or the Redfin or from on the MLS, the Zillow, the the Zillow, (laughs) the Trulia, um, if it's telling you 350, at, at least right now, we know that it's not going to be 350. It, it's going to be. It will be a little more. A little more. I would say, yeah, so, probably three to 5% more. I mean, 10, 15 grand. Absolutely. Yeah, most likely, yeah. So I just wanted to make that quick point for people out there. And I've dealt with that too with people when, when you know, they're looking and they're like, oh, great, 350. This is going to be perfect. I'm like, okay. Now, in order for us to build a strong offer and work with David and work with our lender to put it together a strong offer, we're most likely going to have to be over 350. So just keep that in mind when it comes again back down to if you're increasing your purchase price, this monthly payment is going to be increased in X, Y, Z. Right. Yeah, and, and just a, a quick note of reference as well for people, because uh, I, I think these little like tools help a lot, you know, just trying to simplify it as much as possible. For most circumstances, whether you're comparing, you know, FHA and conventional, VA is a little bit different, but FHA and conventional, pretty similar here. Uh, for every thousand dollars of the purchase price, or essentially loan amount, right? If it goes up or down a thousand, you're looking at your payment changing roughly five to six dollars a month, right? So, it, that's really what I also like to do for my clients when we meet is we lock in, let's say three fifty. They know it's around, you know, twenty one seventy three. Okay, if they're going to go up twenty thousand dollars to three seventy, well, twenty times five to six dollars a month you're looking about a hundred and ten dollars if you're splitting the difference right so that kind of gives them those mental tools of saying like okay and i've noticed this with my clients a lot when they have that tool they can say oh yeah this is totally worth a hundred dollars more a month like this twenty thousand gets me across this street i'm across shaw now and i'm over here and i go into this school district like okay that's worth it i'll swing a hundred dollars i'll find it in my budget to make that work because that that makes sense so it's it's not like it's not going to affect your payment as significantly as like when you're buying a car. You know, oftentimes it's closer to twenty dollars a month, fifteen, eighteen, twenty dollars a month for every thousand on a home because of the term and the interest rate. It really is only about cool. five, six bucks a month. Cool, sweet. So we have the the monthly payment. What would what would somebody expect if they're looking at that three fifty price point right now? What would be a ballpark down payment closing costs all in cash to close? Yeah, so great question. Uh, if you're looking at uh, if you're looking on the FHA side. Uh, uh, the the down payment's going to be about twelve, two fifty, right? So just under twelve three, and then the other closing costs, it's going to depend, right, on the circumstances, right? But most likely, you're going to be looking at somewhere around seven and a half to eight thousand dollars for. Now, when I say closing costs, I say also kind of cash to close, the other cash to close, because technically, the prepaid, like we talked about earlier, that property taxes and insurance account is not 
technically a closing cost. And right. that's where some of the less honest lenders mm -hmm. I've seen when they're explaining their loan estimates or they're going over fees, they've told clients of mine in the past, oh, this guy's ripping you off because look at all these fees he's got. Our closing costs are only you know X amount. And then when I go over that same estimate with them, the total money out of pocket for the other one was a thousand plus dollars more expensive than yeah. mine because they weren't being truthful. They weren't explaining things in the way that the client understood. They were technically correct, but there is, I think, a certain kind of honesty where you need to interpret what the client understands and how they're seeing it and actually present it in a way that is understandable, yeah. right? So, so getting of, down to the brass tacks yeah, is kind of how you look at it. Yeah, exactly. And what a client, when a client's talking to you about closing costs, they don't mean the technical one-time fees that don't include taxes and insurance. They mean, hey, how much, how much freaking money do I need to bring to buy this house? If I want that house, how much money do you need from me? They're not trying to get nitty gritty right, and separate. Right. That's not what they're trying to do. So I think exactly, cut into the brass tacks and just saying it in a way that they are actually meaning it. Understanding what the client means when they say closing costs is how much other money besides that 12,000, three, almost $300 of down payment do I need? And the answer is roughly around seven and a half to 8,000. So currently the 350 price point, you're looking at about just over $20,000 yep. that you have to part with. I would say right at right around 20, it would be pretty safe. Yeah. Okay. So you're parting with $20,000 and you're signing up for 2173 a month roughly at mm -hmm. that 350 yep. price point with an FHA purchase. Mm -hmm. And again, FHA typically is used for people who ha maybe have struggles with credit or um, debt to income stuff, usually had a little bit bumpier stuff. Yeah. And often if you're sitting here thinking, oh, there's no way I'm going to be able to buy a house, FHA would probably be a good tool for you because of the reasons that we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the other circumstance that it runs into is, let's say you're like maybe a single family income home, or yeah. you, uh, you know, maybe one of the one of the partners or a significant others might be stay at home, or there might be a kid at home. There could be so many circumstances, and you're just trying to qualify for the house that actually suits your needs. And maybe you're on a conventional loan approved for three hundred five, but FHA gets you qualified for three fifty. I mean, what's the right loan product? The right loan product is the one that gets you the house that you need. It's, right. it's really that simple. That's yeah. the simplicity of it. It's people overthink it and well, no, but well, then conventional does They're this trying to that. game the system it's, in some it's, way. It's not that complicated. Yeah. The right loan product is the one that gets you the house that you need. It is that simple. Cool. Yeah. I love it. So we covered our one FHA example. You mentioned we're going to compare that to two others. What's our next comparison the next one you guys have me pull up and i think it's a good option is just looking at a, a conventional at 400 with five percent down right so theoretically if you're a first-time home buyer you could go three uh but i think five percent is great because it could be someone getting their second home third home or first home uh and so basically pretty straightforward five percent of four hundred thousand you know you're looking at about twenty thousand right twenty thousand dollars is going to be the down payment closing costs in terms of going from 350 to 400 don't move very much. It's it's the down payment is going to move a little bit more aggressively with the purchase price because mm -hmm. it's directly tied to the purchase price, right? The percentage right. is going to move up accordingly. On the closing costs, I would anticipate that your closing costs might go to, you know, 8200 or 8500 at the most. Great. So you might be looking at 700 to $1000 difference, you know, in the so, closing costs. So your purchasing power is $100,000 more. Mm -hmm. And you have to part with a little bit more money, so you're looking more like that twenty-eight to thirty thousand dollars. Well, I think on this one, it's only a fifty thousand dollar bigger purchase price, right? From three fifty to four hundred. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But your purchase price, yeah, you're basically you're purchasing at fifty thousand dollars more, and in this scenario, your cash to close is going to go up maybe eight thousand dollars. And what does it look like for your payment? Because this is the important part. Yeah. So the the payment on this one, and obviously it's. I have this, all of these scenarios estimated on, you know, pretty good credit, you know, well, in the absolutely. 740 range. So uh, obviously that's going to vary. And that's where the, you, you see the biggest disparity between conventional and FHA. I mean, you see the gap is on comparing apples to apples, hundreds and hundreds of dollars. But for this scenario, we're, we're going excellent credit. You'd be looking at about a, let me see, because I have it pulled up on the cash to close, but your payment would be roughly about 2377. So you're buying a house. 50,000 more in this market, $50,000 is a big jump. Yes. Right. So you go from being only able to afford really three bedroom, two baths. Mm -hmm. Now you're in the ballpark where 400, you might be able to get a pool mm -hmm. or a fourth bedroom or more square footage. There's a lot of different variants. Absolutely. And your payment is only a couple hundred dollars more. Yeah. I mean, just, just 
barely a couple dollars over 200. Yeah, 200 dollars so, more. So that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. So you had talked about five dollars a th per thousand. It did not calculate because it's a totally different product. Exactly, and that's where I think this is a perfect example of if you were just trying to go, oh well, he told me five to six dollars, so fifty thousand, it should go up maybe two seventy five. Well, in this scenario, it's not, and that's because a couple different factors, primarily that mortgage insurance on conventional loans is very sensitive to your credit score and right. your down payment. Right. FHA is kind of, it's been, you know, socialized, mm -hmm. right? So right. you could be an 890 credit score, you could be a 600 credit score, you're gonna get the same rate on your mortgage insurance on an FHA loan. And so right. really huge benefit if you're on the lower end of the credit spectrum. For conventional, the better your credit score, the more they're gonna reward you because you're lower risk to, the, cool. to them. Cool, so if you're looking online now, now you have at least an idea, okay, so we're thinking we're gonna be a little bit closer to 30,000, looking at paying 2,300 a month. That covers my, my principal, interest, mortgage insurance, uh, property, ta taxes. property taxes, and home, in home, home insurance. insurance. Exactly right. So people keep in mind, when we say these 2,300, 2,100, your parents, when you talk to your parents and you ask them what their mortgage is, they might tell you just the principal and interest. Exactly. Keep in mind, your principal and interest on this home is not 23. It's probably what, like 17? Uh, so yeah, it'd be 1786. See? So when your parents say, oh, I only pay $1,000 a month, well, their true cost of the home is going to be more than that. Well, and just I, know we're trying to give yes. you the brass tax of what the home will cost you per month. Well, yeah. And I think the other, it's great that you brought up parents, right? Because I try to, I try to arm my clients when I'm talking with them with the right kind of information because I know that the gauntlet that it is like a family barbecue oh, and then yeah. they're like oh <laughs> what kind of mortgage did you get oh what rate did you get how much oh wow there's I can't some believe social it. status I, there there's it's just this weird desire to compare mortgages which it's just no two circumstances are the same <laughs> and I feel like it would be like oh how much did you get back on your taxes this year like it's it's just your circumstances are not my circumstances. What if this person has four kids? This person yeah. is single. There's you no know, industry one's standard. One's self-employed. One's W two. It's not that simple. But people just love to compare and contrast and try to, you know, say, "Oh, no, well, I got a really good deal on my mortgage," because they want to feel good about, you know, their purchase. Which I, I get, but it's just it really puts, especially first-time homebuyers, at this very dis big disadvantage because they don't know all the tools to combat those questions. And so I try to cool. educate them like, hey, their property taxes were also very different. So know that if they bought 10, 15 years ago, they're locked in, at, they got locked yep. in at a much lower tax rate. And then as their home value has risen, their property taxes is lagging far behind what their actual home's value is. And if your parent were to purchase that same home that they've had 10, 15 years now, trust me their payment would be shocking to them because it would be yeah. significantly different so, oh absolutely yeah it's just apples to car tires i mean they're not the same thing at all it's not in the right. same realm so you have one last estimate mm -hmm. and it's a comparison to the same 400 same loan type yes. and now we're talking about a different down payment exactly correct so obviously a, a portion of the payment and, and on the on the estimate i had for five percent down the mortgage insurance also, it's like the big, bad, you know, scary wolf. It, on the conventional option with that credit score, it was only like 93 bucks. So, I mean, that's to where To not I, have to bring 20%. To not have to bring 20%. To not have to bring another $60,000 down on your down payment. I mean, that's a huge investment. And maybe you're pulling from a 401k or gift funds or Can, emergency funds. I don't know that that pencils out is really making sense to drain those funds to you know, lower your payment sum, obviously, as we're gonna see because your principal's lower, but mortgage insurance is not always as bad or scary or expensive as you might think. And with our current economy, it's important to bring up, with inflation, the value of the dollar does change. Mm -hmm. So your 60,000 a day is worth more than 60,000 down the line because inflation will make it worth less. That 98 bucks. You know, you told somebody back in the 80s, $100, it's a totally different thing than $100 today. Yeah. So keep in mind, you're financing that and you're at a locked rate. That That isn't going to go up with the no. time. No. And it falls off once you hit a certain equity percentage. Exactly. And that's really the, the other thing to think about as well is 20% is the jump start on getting rid of mortgage insurance on a conventional loan. But if you uh, get to that equity number, right, if the value of your home is... 20% uh, greater than what you owe on it, 
then you can get your mortgage insurance removed. I have clients that are getting, you know, because of some of the, you know, increases of home values recently, they've been in their house for a year or two years and they've been able to call their mortgage servicer or we've done refinances to knock their mortgage insurance off. Completely. So yeah, that's something that's not gonna be on there for the life of the loan. Cool. FHA loans, they will be. And that's why people usually, you know, we'll start with that and then switch to a conventional loan. But great point. Yeah, it's cool. not something that's there for cool. forever. Just wanna bring that up. Yeah, and then so uh, just side by side, the 20% down on a $400,000 purchase, pretty easy math, $80,000 is gonna be your down payment. And the payment would be right about two thousand dollars a month. So essentially, Ugh. yeah. So you're taking another sixty grand, and then oh. you're dropping your payment about three hundred and seventy dollars. I'm gonna say for my situation, because again, nobody's situation is the same. I can't see a day that I would bring sixty thousand dollars more a month to save three hundred dollars a month, yeah. because I feel that with my expertise in our real estate industry that I can make more money with the $60,000 by investing it in stocks, in real estate, putting it towards anything, that I'll make more money than just saving $300 a month. Well, yeah, and you can realistically, if you wanted, if it was in the cards for you, I know you guys are already doing this, and I wanna convert my primary to an investment property, mm -hmm. You know, maybe this year or next year, but $60,000 would be 15% of 400 so that would be like the down payment on an investment property if you wanted it right right so i mean you're really gonna okay i'm gonna lower my primary payments 350 bucks or whatever a month or i could go out here and go purchase an investment property have someone else be paying off that investment growing equity over here and making me the 300 exactly and so there's just so many other ways where i think you could leverage that money for other things or just a rainy day fund you know an emergency fund i mean everyone's needs and a willingness to take on risk yeah, is very different. And so for some clients, they're gonna wanna leverage it like I think we all would, where, we're, hey, we're, no, we're a little younger, we wanna leverage this money towards getting more investments. We're not retiring soon. No, and, and for someone who might be retiring, they might go, hey, I'm on a fixed income. What makes the most sense to me is to put down that 20% and lock in a payment that I'm very comfortable with. So I'm not gonna try to talk someone out of it, I just wanna right. make sure that the reasons that someone has for spending that much money makes sense. And Go for it. That's a great point. I was going to say, just like the right loan type is going to be the one that gets you into the house you love, the, the right down payment for you or the right structure for you is going to be the one that makes you comfortable, not somebody else. Exactly. Right? That, not to say there's any right or wrong answer, right? Yeah. But, like, but like you said, each person's different. It's, it's up to each person individually to their risk tolerance, what they yes. feel like they are comfortable mm -hmm. doing. And it's up to us to lay out those options for them and inform them and then they can make the decision yeah, for themselves. I, and I completely agree with that. And I think that's the biggest thing is that it's easy to get into the kind of mode where you wanna coach and you wanna push, right? There's a little bit of coaching and pushing that comes in to play, I know from all of us and our positions in the, throughout the transaction. But in all reality, I feel like I'm more than anything an interpreter or a translator, right? I'm I'm taking what lenders say and guidelines are and loan speak, you know, all of these terms, cash to close, debt to income ratio, closing costs, prepaids, impounds, escrow, title. There's so many terms that get thrown around and some of them like escrow means three different things, which how are you supposed to understand that? It's when, a time, yeah. a place. And, and, a, and a, yeah, time, a place, and, and a, a company. company, and an account. You have escrow accounts. I mean, yeah, there's just so many different four. things. So it's like, I think that that is really more often my job is to be a translator and an interpreter and be an advocate for what my clients' needs are, right? To ask those really good questions, to get to know what their motivations are, what their fears are, their risk tolerances, what they're comfortable with, and then help them navigate the process um, and get what they want so that they don't have buyer's remorse. Because that I don't want someone hitting me up six months later and being like, man, this really isn't what I wanted. I can't yeah, believe you put hard. me in this. Yeah. Like that would be, that would make me feel really terrible. Well, shoot, dude, this was super helpful, especially to help cure the, the misconception about 20% down. Yeah. For those of you who heard that you need 20% down, now you see the value and you make the decision for yourself if it's worth it or not. And know that there's tons of options. I also want to point out that we only went over a couple of like the very, very common ones. Mm -hmm. If you're a doctor, there's special mm -hmm. loans. If you're uh, 
uh, hometown hero loans. Is that still a thing? Uh, there's there's a lot of different names. There's a lot like, of say, different stuff. More often than not, like you getting into like yeah, possibly higher dollar amounts or for doctors who are coming out of school and don't aren't yet working. Or Contacted high, yeah, employees. Jumbo. I mean, bank statement loans for people who are self employed and their money doesn't always you know represent for their income on of their business on their tax returns. I mean, they're really we're just like scooping the very very you know tip of the iceberg you yeah. know and it's the more vanilla type of loans but there's just so many different ways to solve people's problems of getting into a house and you know you might look at some of these other options and be like oh, okay no i don't want to do that i'll wait until like you right there are options to try to get you into a house sooner than than later but we looked at what it what those options were and what it would require and you're like mm, no that's not i'm gonna go the more traditional route and i'm gonna get my ducks in a row first and then that's how i'm gonna proceed and hilariously i look back and i wish to myself that i maybe had taken one of those routes because had i gambled on the market the market went up you yeah. know almost what i think it was something like 11 percent, and my payment would have been high I would be paying a lot more than the normal rates that you're just hearing. Mm -hmm. And right now when I'm getting qualified for a traditional purchase, I could be doing a refinance and be refinancing out of a bank statement loan and getting into a lower interest rate and probably remove my uh, mortgage insurance because I'm at 20%. Yeah. So you know what? I can speak from personal experience that I've made the mistake of thinking don't do it or do it. Really, the best option was to talk to David and figure out, you know, what my right my you. risk tolerance yeah, and what was right for you. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, and I'm glad that I'm here now, and here we are, and everything works out, and it's fine and dandy. Yeah, I I, I completely agree. So this is step one to buying a house. If you are hitting us up on Instagram or calling us, and uh, you're thinking, how do I buy a house? This is a really really great podcast to listen to. Uh, and figure it out. And I think this would be great for us to be able to send now to our clients to say, hey, especially for the immediate future, like, hey, here's where we were in February. But even for years to come, the, the what we've talked about today will be long lasting. Applicable. The only thing that won't be is the interest rate uh, and how that varies. And to be honest, that varies day to day. So even yeah. tomorrow, <laughs> this won't be the exact same. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, David, Dude, thank you for coming on and You're sharing welcome, all your knowledge with yeah. both of us, all of you out there listening and watching. Um, David is an absolute beast, a killer. If you guys uh, reach out to Scott and I, he's one of our go-to lenders um, that we refer people out to and just a really great guy, great friend. Um, David, for anybody out there who may want to contact you gr directly, have more questions, interested in the pre-approval process or kind of seeing where they're at, where can they find you on social media? What's a good way to contact you? Uh, so yeah, you can, I, my, my Instagram honestly doesn't really reflect a ton of lending stuff. There are some videos and things on there that I think are still useful. So you could look me up on Instagram. It's just D Keller, A N D C O D Keller and co. That's my Instagram. It's public. So you know, anyone can take a look there. Uh, but if you want to reach out to me directly, uh, you can reach out to me via phone number, which I'm sure you guys could put up on the screen. But yeah, 559-313-4712. Uh, and then I have a assistant, a full-time assistant as well that helps me you know, stay on top of things. So I have a team email and it's just my last name, Keller Team at nexamortgage.com, which is N-E-X-A mortgage.com. So Perfect. Yeah, reach out. It. I'd love to talk to you. Well, David, thanks again for coming in, my man. We appreciate it. All of you guys out there listening, um, please listen to all the information David was saying in here. Super, super helpful information. It's stuff that we're going to repeat to you during the home buying process. It's stuff David's going to repeat to you during the home buying process. Um, so super informational episode. Thank you guys for tuning in, and we will see you next week. Thanks, guys.